morning, Sunday Church. Good morning. Now, I do not know about you, but I am fascinated by the British royal family. Anybody else? Oh, yeah. Okay, this is your message. Okay, I love this. So, maybe it started with my mother. She reads everything she can about the life of Princess Diana. Or maybe it was my own repeated viewings um, of Disney Princess movies growing up. I don't know. Or a combination of the two. But somewhere along the way, I became highly invested in all things royal. When asked who I would have lunch with, so I was asked this question, if I could get anyone in the world alive right now to have lunch with, I would not even have to think about it. My answer would absolutely be Catherine, now the Princess of Wales. I just admire her so much. I appreciate her grace, her dedication, her commitment to her role within the royal family. And I'm not going to lie, I spoke down some of the same tennis shoes that she wears, and some of her photographs, you can get them on Amazon. They are in my cart <laughs> as we speak. Sweetie, my birthday's coming. <laughs> but when I traveled to England with, on a school trip, I went a couple of years ago with my oldest children. We visited Buckingham Palace. And while we were there, the flag was raised. And we know what that means, right? It indicates that the queen was in residence. So I thought, I'm here. I am with the queen. I mean, a courtyard and a palace separates us, and guards are security, and she has no idea who I am or that I'm standing outside. But I'm telling you, she is right there, and I am right here. And this, people, this is a moment. And yet, Despite everything that may seem like it's just right on the surface, there has to be some tough stuff. There's tough stuff in everything. We know that Prince Harry's autobiography was just released. According to the Guinness Book of World Records, sold more first day of release copies than any other nonfiction book in history. And there's a lot of he said and she said, but crisscrossing all of it is an overwhelming sense of hurt and pain. And we don't know the details. We don't need to know the details. But from an outsider looking in, like I am, trying to peer through the windows of Buckingham Palace, there's a lot to be seen. And a lot of that is hurt. Whether it's warranted or not is not the issue. The fact is that it's there. And maybe you and I, we haven't written a tell-all story. Maybe there's no media sensation. Maybe no one even knows what's happening in our world or in our sphere but us. But it's very likely there's places in our lives where we are processing, we're dealing with, we're navigating, and we're mitigating hurt. And everything that that entails. The loneliness, the sadness, maybe anger, maybe profound discouragement, all of it. And no matter where the hurt originates, we know that it just, in a nutshell, it just stinks. An ongoing situation or a comment, innocuous or intended, that cuts us to our core. An illness, a broken relationship, maybe even a hurting heart on behalf of a friend. Something we thought should have happened, did it. A kindness unreciprocated. A misunderstanding that turns into more. And before we know it, it has snowballed to more than we can keep up with. There's hurt at work. There's hurt at church. There's hurt at home. But the good news in all of this is we are not alone. There is healing for the hurting. And we find it in the words of Jesus as we continue our series today, Red Letter Challenge, a series that asks the questions, what did Jesus say, why does it matter, 
And how does that impact my life today? Will you pray with me as we open our hearts together to jump into the Word today? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity, the gift that it is, to come together and worship you this morning. Thank you for meeting us in this place. We come before you with expectant hearts, Lord. Let us be ready to receive what you have prepared for each one of us so individually today. We thank you in advance for all that you have planned for us. We step forward with anticipation, with bravery, with boldness and courage, Lord, into our future. And we pray these things in the mighty, beautiful, and victorious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 My littlest, Avalon, she's 16 now. She turned 16 last Monday. And um, the, not 24 hours later, she sat me down and informed me that her childhood is now behind her, and she's a woman now. So she was at 16, when she was in kindergarten, I received a call from her teacher. And Avalon had called someone a name on the playground. And I was so surprised to get this call because this was just not my little girl. She was just such a kind, sweet, caring little thing. I had never heard her do or say anything like this before. So I picked her up at school and we sat down to talk about the day. And I asked her, Avalon, what happened? Well, it turned out that someone had said something to her on the playground that had hurt her feelings. And she said, Mom, they said that, and it made me so sad that I got mad. And so I just said the first thing I could think of. I said, okay, well, what, what was that? Can you tell me what you said? And she says, yeah, Mom. I just looked right at them, and I said, oh, yeah, well, well, you, you're a cheeseburger. <laughs> We're still not quite sure how that came together. But her siblings actually take great delight in reminding her of that regularly. Now, as adults, I know we're not going to go around, at least I hope we're not, calling people cheeseburgers when we feel sidelined. But we will most likely respond in some way. We might be loose, we might withdraw, we might feel defensive, or we might go on the attack. But nothing changes that it hurts. But we know from Scripture that there is hope for healing in the hurt. And that's where we're going to spend our few moments together today. In the book of John, with Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well, and a message called, Cheeseburgers Not Required, Finding Healing in the Hurt. If you would, if you have your Bible, would you turn with me to the book of John, chapter or um, if you have your telephone your phone with you, you want to, the YouVersion app, if you don't have that downloaded, that is fabulous. I'm um, really looking at scripture, as well as BibleGateway.com. Amazing resource to have for churches. And we're going to start at the very beginning of the chapter in the book of John. And this portion is often called Jesus and the Samaritan Woman, or maybe you've heard it as the woman in the well. Now, despite the fact that we don't actually know the name of this woman, this story is so significant for many reasons. One of it being that this is Jesus' longest recorded one-on-one -on -one conversation in all of Scripture. And while many of Jesus' miracles and moments from his ministry on earth are recorded in multiple Gospels, we know those as Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, only John recorded this particular story. And it's also a story in which we find a flawed and hurting individual who, because of this hurt, responds in ways that you and I might actually find very familiar. Yet through Jesus' patient responses, we find comfort and hope. Actually, we find our healing in the hurting. And we begin the story as Jesus has left Judea and he's on his way back to Galilee, traveling through Samaria on the way. In verse 5, Jesus reaches a Samaritan village near the field that was given to Joseph by his father, Jacob. Let's jump down to verse 6 and read that. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, 
please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. So we're going to stop here for just a moment because we have a couple of key details in this section that are very worth noting. One, we know from cultural tradition that women drew water in groups in the morning or in the evening. Yet this passage makes it a point to tell us that this story takes place about noon time. So the fact that this woman was coming by herself to the well in the middle of the day when no one else could be there, as a general rule, that tells us a lot about her. It tells us that she was a social outcast, most likely unwelcome to participate in the larger community group. She was lonely and unwelcome, having been ostracized by her community for her past. We'll get into that in a little bit. Her feelings and her heart. The other thing I love about this is that Scripture takes the time in these verses to mention that Jesus was tired. And yet he still had the longest recorded, as we mentioned, one-on-one -on -one conversation. Because that's intentional. I believe that the scripture is pointing out that Jesus was tired. It's so purposeful. Every single word is. Because it reminds us, because sometimes we just need reminded. We know it, but sometimes we just need reminded that there will never be an impediment to receiving Jesus' time, energy, or attention. In fact, we know he waited for the woman to arrive at the well. We, he knew she was coming. We know that he did. And we know that even today, and this reminder is so critical for all of us, just to stop for a second and remember that he is waiting for us to come before him, to seek, and to have a dialogue with our Jesus. Because too often, and I am so guilty of this, we try to fix things on our own. Or we think that this hurt, this feeling is actually well, okay, the whole grand scheme of the universe, it's probably really not that big a deal. So maybe just a little small for Jesus' time right now. But we know that that can never be the case because we know that our God is the God of the details. If he's going to take the time to know the number of hairs on our head, he's going to take the time to know the most intimate details of our heart. Why? Because Jesus is good at the small stuff. Let's go to verse 9. The woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? We know also culturally that Jews and Samaritans did not like each other. We know from scholars that most Jews despised Samaritans in this time and place. But we know also that this question reveals so much more than just a generational animosity between people groups. It reveals that this woman is cognizant of her hurt. In fact, it's at the forefront of every interaction she has. She is so used to being hurt that she wants to know, why are you asking me? No one ever asks me. Because it's true that sometimes when we are hurt, the only thing we can see is what is in front of us. And it colors all of our movements. It impacts how we respond in any given situation. In fact, we become so familiar with the hurt that hurt is the all we can understand. You know, Brene Brown, she's an incredible professor and author. She writes, a deep sense of love and belonging is an irreducible need of all people. We are biologically, cognitively, physically, and spiritually wired to love, to be loved, and to belong. <laughs> when those needs are not met, we don't function as we were meant to. We break. We fall apart. We numb. We ache. We hurt others. We know that we aren't meant to break. 
or fall apart, or numb, or ache, but has never been God's intention. And how do we know that? We actually know it from the very next verse, verse 10. Jesus replied, if you only knew the gift God has for you, and whom you are speaking to, you would ask me, and I would give you living water. If we only knew the gifts that our Heavenly Father has prepared for us, because do you think it's true that sometimes we forget who we are speaking to? The maker of heaven and earth. Because it's true that we often put our limitations that we see in ourselves and in people, we ascribe those to our heavenly Father. Rather than do the opposite and place God's lack of limitation on ourselves or on the people around us. We get that backwards as humans a lot. And the question is, how much freedom would we walk in if we could split that ground? And when we look at ourselves, we're hard on ourselves, let's be honest. When we look at ourselves, we would see the expanse of opportunity and potential and purpose and vision that our Heavenly Father sees. And the same for everyone that He has so intentionally placed in our life because not a single person is there by accident. Amen. And I'm including going to the grocery store and every single person we meet. It's not by accident. There are no coincidences in the Hebrew language. Every moment with our Jesus is intentional. How would it flip the script to put the expanse of our Heavenly Father on ourselves and on the people around us, and also to stop putting the disadvantages that we see in ourselves and the hard things that we walk through with other people and say, well, you know what, because I walked through it on this earth, that must be God. We put ourselves in a very dangerous place when we forget to let God do God. It changes everything. And we're intentional to remember, yeah, what I see, this is just the natural. It is not my Jesus. It is not what my Jesus can do. It is not who my Jesus is. There are no limitations to Jesus or his healing. We know from scripture, over 6,000 of them in scripture, promises that he will do what he says he will do. He will change for victory what he says he will change. And church, if he says he's going to move the mountain, he is going to move that mountain. Isaiah 65, 24, Isaiah is my favorite book in the Bible. I love Isaiah. It says, I will answer them before they even call to me. While they are still talking about their needs, I will go ahead and answer their prayers. Is that an amazing verse or what? I love that verse. Here we are talking about stuff. And God's like, you know what? I've got this figured out. I have the plan. I have the victory. But here's the thing, church. We have to go before our Father and say, okay, Lord, I am asking for the plan. I'm asking for the victory. I don't know what it's going to look like, but I'm going to step forward in courage, and Lord, I'm going to receive it, and I'm going to love it, and I'm going to be brave, and I'm going to be bold, even though maybe I've been scared to death, because I'm going to know that you've got me, you've got this, and you're in control. Because sometimes I think we we think, no we do, but we think that well maybe God's waiting to show up until after the hurt takes place. Like he's got to wait for it to happen and then he's gonna bring the victory. But see again, we've got backwards. Because Jesus is already there before the hurt has even taken root. He's already given us his full and undivided attention. 
Because the minute that we as humans we feel that hurt, whatever it might be, and that just pierces our soul, the minute that happens, church, the healing has already begun. We might not feel it quite yet. We're human. We have some emotions that we process and walk through. But it is happening. But it's up to us to reach out to say, Jesus, yes, I receive it. Let's stop talking about our issues because we're, we're still here doing it. God's so patient when He's already got the victory in motion. Because the truth is, if we have to be willing as we take that step of faith to receive that victory, to receive the answer, if we're going to heal, allow God to heal our hurt, we have to be willing to cross the boundaries that we've created around ourselves. It's going to require getting out of our comfort zone. It's going to require breaking down some walls. It's going to require circling the walls of Jericho and singing the praises of our heavenly Father. Amen. Because sometimes these boundaries that we've made, they may seem at first glance to us, seem protective. And that's not to say that there's not healthy boundaries sometimes that God gives us and helps grow in our lives. We're not talking about those. We're talking about the unhealthy ones that we put up to say, well, you know what? Nobody can hurt me anymore. Because I've got this. And nothing is coming through this. Well, when nothing is coming through this, we're not walking out of it into God's victory. Because boundaries that are built of hurt will only create destruction in our lives and in the lives of people we care about. They'll only cook in the sin. We have to have the courage, church, the faith to cross the boundaries and immerse in the living water. Amen. Verse 11. We'll go back, our woman is talking, but sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket, she said, and this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoy? And I love this scripture because it's just so real, because it reminds us, we know that doubt and discouragement are real things. And yet we know Jesus, we know, reading this story now, we know Jesus is talking about complete freedom. And the woman is wondering where the literal rope and bucket is going to come from. But we get that. We don't fault her for that. Because we can put ourselves in the same place. I know when I'm in the middle of a tough situation and my responses are fragile, I tend to focus on only what I can see in front of us, in front of me. I'm thinking, okay, Lord, okay, but I'm not seeing the rope and bucket. I'm just, I'm just focused on this little piece in front of me because I'm losing sight of the vertical view, the kingdom perspective. Because it's true that we can get so focused on the how Jesus is going to do what we've asked him to do that we lose sight of the truth that he will. And that's when Jesus is so good to remind us of our future, to remind us that he is good and he is faithful and that, yes, he heals in the hurt. Verse 13, Jesus replied, Anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh, bubbly spring within them, giving them eternal life. And I love this because this is the difference between human and Jesus, between our perspective and his. Because we're talking about our problems. While Jesus is focused on our hope, our future, and our eternity with him. Because we know that we church, that we look at our lives from beginning to end, but we know that our Jesus with that vertical view and that kingdom perspective, he's looking at the eternity. 
and walking back to where we are today to say, come on, we can do this. You've got this. I've got you. I love that in most instances in the New Testament, the word hope is the Greek elpis. There is no doubt attached to the meaning, the Greek meaning of this word. No doubt at all. It cannot live in the word hope. Therefore, we know that biblical hope is a confident expectation or assurance based upon a sure foundation for which we wait with joy and full confidence. In other words, when we have our hope in Christ Jesus, there is no room for doubt. I also love the imagery that Jesus used here, that of a fresh, bubbling spring, because it brings to my mind the word pictures of new life, of health, of nourishment, of vitality. These are the qualities within us, in our Jesus, even in the moments that we feel like we are battered down by the storm. I love to think about just that. What a vitality of heart. To know that even if there is something hurt, it will not overtake us. Our Jesus springs forth that which is new and nourishing to our soul. He still has something vital to do in our life. And he's just getting started. Verse 15, please turn the woman said, give me this water, then I'll never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come here. She's talking about the literal well. I won't have to come here to get water. This tells us a lot about the pain in her life, that sentence. And this is relatable as well. Because we might, like this woman, be tempted to negate the long-term healing for the short-term pain. Have we seen that in relationships? They take a lot of work. My husband and I will have been married 25 years this July. Thank you! You got married when I was like two. No, I'm joking. <laughs> but, and I would love to tell you that it has been just smooth sailing. The whole time. Not a care in the world. But I cannot tell you that. Because that would not be true. And we all know that that must be true. Because relationships, they take work. They take commitment to connection. They take prayer. They take time. They take conversation. Even when maybe conversation is the last thing we feel like doing right now is to work things out. And then relationships sometimes, because it does take time, commitment, it does take an effort, it does take that giving of ourselves, even no matter what it might look like, we might be tempted to negate the long-term healing for the short term. Miss Well, did I do okay? Well, didn't work. Okay. Well, okay. Move on. We might be tempted to do that. But how much would we lose in the process? And again, that person, whether it's a spouse, a friend, a family member, a co-worker, whoever it might be, that person again was so intentionally put in our life. So what are we negating? By saying, you know what, it's just easier in the short term to just say, not today. What are we missing by not sticking it out and walking it out, just walking through the hard things? Well, we do it because we hold on to the promise of the future. The other thing I love about this, this little piece is one verse. It's just one verse that says so much. Notice, too, that she has doubts again. Jesus has been encouraging her, teaching her about the living water. And yet again, she's like, I don't know. I, I, does that mean I don't have to come here? Because here it's hard. And I love that Jesus continues to encourage her and speak life into her. And that is so encouraging to me. Because it reminds me that Jesus never gives up, even when we stumble in the healing process. Because it's true that a hurt might be 
on the situation. It can be so very deep. It might not heal on the one day. But none of that's okay. This is where we give ourselves the grace to have patience with ourselves and to have patience with the process. Because it's true that Jesus, he's got the pacing down. He's got this figured out. He's got this plan. He's got it in the his hand. We're good. And God is good. And God is good. Amen. Verse 16, go and get your husband, Jesus told her. I don't have a husband, the woman replied. Jesus said, you're right, you don't have a husband. You have had five husbands, and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. And this explains the ostracism from her community. And then Jesus says, you certainly spoke the truth. But the thing here, this is not accusatory. In fact, this is spoken in love because what Jesus is saying right now is I'm telling you, woman of the well, that I know your past and I am here for your future. There's no secrets without Jesus. We might want to think that there is because maybe there's a little shame and guilt mixed in, but there are no secrets. He knows everything. That we're feeling or enduring or walking through or hoping for. And you know what? No matter how rotten we might feel about it or how rotten we might think that makes us, it doesn't impact who we are in our Jesus' eyes. Because He still fights for us. We are still His kid, created in His image, a victorious chosen people. Amen. Let's jump down to verse 23 where Jesus responds. But the time is coming, indeed it's here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. For God is spirit, so those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. To worship in spirit and in truth. We know that to worship is to adore. To adore our Father in our desire to honor Him, in our commitment to spend time in prayer, listening to His voice, studying His Word, to trust Him enough to allow Him the room and the space to heal us, even in the hurt. Did you know what that is, church? That's having the courage to get out of our own way. Say, Lord, I am going to adore you. This is what it looks like in front of me. Lord, I am going to say, you are good and you are worthy of praise. Even if I don't necessarily feel like my life is praiseworthy right now. Because we know that praise precedes the promise. We know that. We know that worship shines far and above the word. We know that spending time in the Word and in prayer and in getting just so intimately acquainted with our Lord's voice. That's worshiping Him in spirit and in truth. To know that we know that we know without a shadow of a doubt what He has spoken through Scripture and to us personally in prayer and quiet time. To know that He has spoken to our spirit, to receive it, to accept it, and to walk in it. To worship him in spirit and in truth. The story continues as Jesus tells the woman, I am the Messiah. This is one of the rare times that he speaks these words in scripture. And the woman leaves her water jar, and I love this. She willingly runs back to her village to engage with the villagers, the people who have ostracized her before. She runs to tell everyone to come, meet this Messiah. And we know from scripture, from her story, many, many, many from the village were saying Jesus spent time there and telling the woman, the people in the village, verse 42, tells the woman, now we believe, not just because of what you told us, but because we have heard him ourselves. Now we know that he is indeed the Savior of the world. Amen. 
Because the truth is, when we aren't living in heart, we become bold. Bold in faith and bold in action. This woman who didn't even want to get water at the same time as her fellow villagers is now telling them with joy the story of the Messiah, becoming the first evangelist that we see in Scripture, and changing the trajectory of lives throughout her entire community. So the question is, as we close, what boldness would be present in our lives if we weren't bound by hurt? If we were healed from the hurt? What would God be used to do through each of us to bravely and boldly accept his healing? As our time comes, comes to its end, the Lord has put it on my heart to specifically pray for those who have been hurt in church. I know there's lots of places to get hurt. But church can be, I'm not saying it's the toughest, but it's a top one. Because we think it shouldn't happen here. Right? But the truth is, this building is not the church. God's people are the church. Amen. I know people, and I know the first time experience, for me, I'm messy. I don't get everything right. And sometimes things, we don't get things right together in the church. It's a place where we do get hurt. It's a place that I was hurt in church. The Lord lived it on my heart to just share this story, this testimony quickly. I shared it about three years ago, so some of you may have heard it, some of you maybe not. But I believe that the Lord said to share it here today. Um, I grew up in church and in faith. And I just believed who my Jesus was from the time I was a very little girl. But that didn't mean that there wasn't stuff that was hard and stuff that got in the way in my life. And when I was in my young twenties, married with some three little kids at that time, three of our five, I had some real doubt moments. So much so that I, I just, I didn't go to church. I just, I wrestled too much. I'm like, Lord, I can't even, I can't even go to church, Lord. It's just hard. So I'm just trying to figure this out. And this went on for a couple of years, and I know just precious people were praying for me. My husband, who had just recently accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, and he was praying for me at that time, and he was going. And I know from those prayers, the Lord put a tug on my heart. The Lord said, you need to go. Just, you need to walk, have the courage to walk into the doors of the church building and go to service. So I'm asking you to just do this, this one thing. I want you to do this. Is it okay, Lord? So there was a team service on Sunday night. And there was actually, it was, it, was a, it was at this house, but before we were summoned in a different building. And, and there was a team service. My husband was going to be there. Um, the, the youth pastor was going to be leading worship. And, and the message went, oh, this would be great. I could go with the kids. Um, and I, I can pay Lord, I can do this. So that night, the doors opened and we came in. Um, the service had already started. Um, praise and worship was beginning. The youth pastor was on the stage. And I'm like, Joel is now right here, up here, playing his guitar and leading in worship. And I came in the back and, and sat down in the back row with our three little ones. I didn't want to be disruptive, but I knew the Lord had told me to be there. I want to be obedient despite the doubt. And we sit down, and my husband's in the no brain of the team, so it's just me and the kids. And, and the worship leader, he's, he's got the first song going, he's singing, he's playing the guitar, he's leading worship. All of these teenagers are singing and worshiping, and he happens to look up and look right back at me. 
and he starts singing. He starts singing the whole song. He starts singing, and then he starts playing. And of course, no one knows quite what's happening. So the whole room kind of filters down to quiet murmur, and suddenly just complete silence. And the youth pastor who put his guitar down next to him, he walked down the stairs of the stage. It's just a couple of stairs. He walked directly down the aisle straight to me, stood in front of me, looked down at me in my pretty little precious kids. And he said, you are not welcome here. You need to leave. And so I got up with our three little ones. We walked out the door of that church. It was actually this, this church before it was seven. And I had to walk back in. For hope of time. Now, I'm not saying it was him. In that moment, whatever the enemy was telling him or feeding him, he just chose to part with it. I don't have any animosity toward him. It wasn't him. It was a moment that the enemy used to wound me so deeply that I didn't know if I could ever recover. Because the truth is, church, we will get hurt. And we will get hurt in this beautiful place of worship in God's house because there's people. And people are love and people are love. But people, we know, people are messy. And sometimes the enemy, he just, he's able to do a few things. But here's the victory in that story. Welcome well, back I'm here today. <laughs> Is that for those tired years? I know that there were men and women of God who were praying for me. Faithfully. Who were showing they loved me and that Jesus loved me through them in tangible ways. Through meals left on the doorstep. Through that winter time, a whole bag full of just winter, wonderful winter gear for my kids. Just over and over and over, God used these little moments to remind me that He loves me. There is healing in the heart church. I'm not going to say the healing was easy. There were hard moments when I cried out to God and said, I don't understand. But there were also so many beautiful moments when God said, You know what? I got you. And you are going to be okay. Because I am God. And I am God. He brought me into ministry alongside my husband. He brought me reading test walking, reading test. No. So we, there's hurt. Let's give it to God, church. Let's open up our hearts to be healed in the process. Because there's so much that He has for us. I'm going to pull a little scripture before we go to the Lord in prayer. 
Second Chronicles 7, 14. If my people who are called by my, my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin. And I is where the land is wherever we reside. Because there is hurt in our heart. Because there is hurt in our heart. And that is where we have set our tent. We have set our tent on a place of hurt and pain and sorrow. Look at the Lord said, He said, I will remove that pain. I will remove that sorrow. I will replace it with joy and gladness. Because it is my promise that I will heal your land. Amen. If it is our children, we're praying over our children, we're praying over our family, and they're walking through tough stuff, and we can just see their precious spirits just crumbling under the way. This is where we have set up our tent, and we are going to pray legacy, and pray scripture, and pray love, and pray love over our children. And we're going to say, Dear Lord, this child is my name, Lord, and you say it in your word, and I am holding you to your promise, Lord, that you will heal your land. Amen. We pray over our city. We pray over our homes, church. Wherever we are, wherever we may be, we speak the promise of our Heavenly Father, Lord. We may get messed up along the way, but that's okay, God, don't worry, because I am standing on the promise, Lord, that whatever I see in front of you, Lord, you got this, you got this, you are good, and you, even now, before I can even see it with my natural eye, Lord, you are healing my heart, my family, you are bringing restoration and redemption to my life, to my family's life, to the situation, Lord, you have said it, and you have done it, and you will do it again, Lord, because you have, you will, and you are heal this land. Amen. We're going to be brave, church. We're going to be bold. We're going to stand confidently before our Heavenly Father. We're going to say, Lord, I am ready to receive your healing, your hope, and your promise, Lord. I'm ready, Lord. Heal the hurt, Lord. Walk me into the victory. Walk me into the promises, Lord. Because, Lord, we are ready. We are your people. And we are here to speak your kingdom in our homes, our community, our nation, and our world. Why not for today, but for eternity? Amen. I'm going to pray over you today as we close. Can you just bow your heads as we pray? Lord, we come before you today with honor, glory, and praise. We adore you, Lord. We worship you in spirit and in truth in each and every day of our lives. We ask you to bring healing to the areas in our lives that are hurting. We trust you to break apart the heart of Jesus, Lord, to move us past anger, discouragement, or bitterness, and to give us a new perspective, a kingdom perspective, Lord, on how you will use this moment for your glory. Lord, give us a boldness to move past the limitations we've created for ourselves and for others. Allow us to trust you in everything, big and small, and make us uncomfortable, Lord, when we begin to get familiar with the hurt. Don't let us settle there, Lord, but remind us to cling to the hope that we have in you. Remind us, Lord, that you are already on the move. You are already bringing healing to those tiny, broken, hurting places in our hearts. And Lord, for those of us who have been hurt in church, Lord, I pray that you would give an overwhelming measure of grace. That you would walk us through forgiveness of those who hurt us. That you would remind us that it wasn't your children, but the enemy, Lord, and that that enemy is under your feet. He has no jurisdiction here, Lord. We trust you to lead us to complete healing, and that you will give us the words to share our story well. 
to restore all that was stolen, and to redeem all that was tarnished, to speak of your greatness, Lord, to our own thought. And for those of us here, Lord, who haven't yet accepted you into our heart, we do so now. We ask your forgiveness for our sins. We ask you to take up your home and our heart. We give you all of our life to you, Lord, every day. And we ask that you now be forevermore, today, tomorrow, forevermore, Lord, our King and our Savior. We pray this, Lord, as your church, as your children, as your brave, bold, and victorious sons and daughters, Lord, we pray this in the mighty, beautiful, and the victorious name of Jesus Christ. And together the church said, Amen. Amen.